We're going to sing together once again, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Please join us in singing together. It's hard to believe that what we began just a few nights ago is almost over. But I want to welcome you here tonight for our last meeting, our kind of afterglow meeting. It's been a wonderful day, hasn't it? Have you enjoyed the inspiration? And I hope that every one of you feel called, chosen, and committed today. You know, uh, ASI has a long history of inspiring lay people bringing people into action, and it's been nothing less than that this year. And it's our prayer that as we go into this last meeting tonight, that you will have made a new uh, commitment in your heart, that you'll feel that tug of the Holy Spirit saying, you know, you really need to get involved. And we're praying that that happens. Welcome. We're glad you're here tonight. I know that you will enjoy the presentation as we bring the Sabbath to a close and go back to our work, but I hope go back inspired and ready to go to a new level. Thank you very much for being here. As you consider going back and reaching the world next door, we've talked about refugees, about tourists, about immigrants, but please also consider international students. As I got on the plane to head to Thailand a year ago, I sat down next to a young lady who was from Dubai. I assumed she came from Muslim background, but it was not so. She was Hindu who had been living there surrounded by Muslims, grown up as a strong, devoted Hindu, but was now studying in Indianapolis, Indiana, and learning about Christianity from her roommate. So these are people from around the world everywhere. If you think about how many they are and where they come from, it can really open our minds to see what is possible. There are close to one million international students studying, studying in North America. And this is the future leaders of the world or present leaders who are pursuing an advanced degree. They are the elites. They are the ones who have money and are able to come. Those who will go back and either open the gospel in their country, the doors for the gospel, or may close those doors. The great tragedy with this is that 75% of them go home without having ever made an American friend. I don't know what we're doing or how it's happening, how they can go, but they seem to either stick to themselves or somehow are not feeling that friendship as they return. 80% of them do not go back having ever entered a Christian church. We can change that. We can, and I'm, I'm hearing now of different people who are inviting them to their homes for Thanksgiving dinner or maybe for Christmas vacation, who are offering to teach at the university or the college for an hour a week just talking English conversation. I visited a professor, a Seventh-day Adventist up in North Dakota, 
who is inviting his students to come to his home on Friday evenings, and the church is so committed to it that they're providing food so the kids can relax, talk, and discuss the most essential things of life. God is wanting to reach the world, and he can do it through us as we do this. This last year, as I considered it, I thought, I better listen to what I'm telling other people to do. And I was complaining that I wasn't near more refugees and immigrants right there in Berrien Springs, Michigan, by Andrews University, when it hit me that that's one of the most diverse universities in the United States. And I began to ask those who were in charge of international student services if there were any young people on campus who were not Christians. There were a hundred Buddhists, Muslims, different ones, Chinese, secular background. And we started a small group, and we had the joy of watching one young Thai Buddhist give his heart to Jesus and be baptized. The other day, not so young, he's, he's just finished his MBA. I began studying with his girlfriend who had come to visit him. She also is preparing for baptism. And just Tuesday before I left, I saw them off as they are returning to the country of Thailand where they will be able to share the gospel. This is the potential that we have as we will reach the world. Let's pray as we open this evening. Father in heaven, this weekend has come to a whirling end. And Lord, we are inspired. But we also recognize the reality that as we return to our places of work, our schools, our communities, everything will grab our attention as it has before. So Lord, unless you make the difference in our hearts and fill us with such love for the unreached, we will go back to life as normal. Please let it not be so. Please change us more deeply so that when we return, we will be determined to seek for your love for our neighbors every morning and to ask you to put on our hearts your priorities. Lord, as this last evening's meeting is about to begin, Please bless Elder Dan Jackson as he preaches, as he pours out his heart. May each of us hear that which you are wanting to say. And may we walk away with a solid commitment of what you want us to do because your spirit has spoken to us and we have responded. Thank you, Father. Finish your work in us and finish it in the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. I trust that you've been blessed today. It's always a blessing to come to ASI and hear the wonderful things that God is doing all over the world. Kyle, are happy, Kyle and I are happy to be here to share some exciting things with you. And I'd like to start by sharing that you'll be able to take the blessing home with you that you got at ASI. Because over the next few days, all of the meetings that have, been, that have taken place here, including the seminars as well as the main sessions, will all be up on our website at asiministries.org. So we invite you to invite your friends to watch that. Maybe there was a seminar that you really wanted to attend and weren't able to because you needed to go to another seminar or another place. And so all of those materials will be available to you. Um, I also wanted to share something that is the first time that we've done. I'm kind of an open source person. I don't know. Some of you might not understand what that means, but I believe in all of us working together. I don't understand what that means. <laughs> okay. You're a techie guy. <laughs> okay. Well, basically what it means is that as a community, we can accomplish a lot more than any one of us can by ourselves. Amen. Right? Amen. Isn't that the ASI spirit? Yes, it is. Yes. And Amen. so this year we want to give you an invitation. I saw a lot of people taking pictures, a lot of people taking video, and we want to invite you to share that with us. We, of course, had our own for official photographer as well, but we know that we can have a lot more pictures by inviting all of you to share yours with us. So the best way to do that is to contact me on the website, asiministries.org. And if you go to the contact page and send a message to the communications department, I will get that. And so if you have video, if you have pictures, we'd love to be able to collaborate. We will give you credit for that. We're happy for the opportunity to be able to work together in that. And Kyle, I think you have some things to tell us about membership. Well, but first, I have a question. one more question sure. for you, Wayne. Okay. Um, because we talked a lot about social media. Okay. I don't know how many of you remember Jamie came up on the first night, and she talked about posting and, and hashtags and all those kinds of things. We want you to use our hashtag, and I'm not talking about, you know what I'm talking about, right? Those of you that are, okay, pound sign, okay? ASI Ministries, Wayne. That's we right. want people to use that not only here at convention, but all throughout the year, because we want people to know what ASI members are up to. That's right. 
And in fact, what I'm really excited about is that this year we kind of started social media fairly close to convention, but we're already thinking about what we want to do throughout the whole year to prepare for next year's convention. So please do use the hashtag ASI Ministries whenever you post anything about this event so that we can all share it together. Uh, Wayne, I was looking for my phone, but I think I dropped it back there. But if you have your phone, I'd encourage you to take it out and like our Facebook page, like the ASI Facebook page. That's right. That way you can get updates as we post them and you can stay in touch with us throughout the year. And you can follow us on Twitter if you'd like as well. All right, that's great. So, ASIministries.org, sound good? <laughs> Amen. Okay. I would even encourage you tonight when you go to the exhibit hall, take some selfies and say, I'm here at the exhibit hall at ASI. Actually, you and I did one last year. I can't we remember did. when that was. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> encourage you to go and take, here's what, take a picture by your favorite booth. How does that sound? Okay, so tonight, before it's all done, go and take a picture, post it up, and say, I'm at ASI. I hope you can be here next year. Now, at the end of tonight, Steve and I are going to talk about next year, but first I want to just make an invitation. I know we mentioned this, uh, Wayne, uh, briefly this morning at the beginning of, beginning of church. ASI is a family. ASI is a family of supporting ministries, of businesses, of professionals who long to see the soon return of Jesus. And we want you to know that we believe there are many of you out here today that would qualify to be members of ASI, mm -hmm. and we want, we want you to be members. And so if you have been, your heart has been touched as you've been here this week, and you'd like to find out more about becoming a member of ASI, we want to invite you, for the graphic will go up right now, um, we want to invite you to send a text message to that number that we showed earlier today at church. And, <laughs> and there, we um, go. there it is. Yeah, okay, it's, right it's, it's 301 844 6035. Wayne, why is it important to become a member of ASI? Well, being a member of ASI just allows us to be able to share in the ASI family. It allows us to be able to exchange ideas with each other. It allows us to be able to really offer <clears throat> even services between ministries. That's one thing that I've been so blessed by is just to see how excited ministries are when we can offer something to them and they can offer something to us in return. And being part of the ASI family is a wonderful way to do that. And you know what? People often ask me, what do I get out of being a member? Well, there's a lot of things you get out of being a member, and we could list them in terms of being networked with a family of like-minded believers that long to see Jesus come, about coming to convention, all the things that are part of ASI. But the best thing, honestly, the best thing about being a member of ASI is that the spirit of ASI, for all of us that are a part of this ministry, is that we want to give. Mm -hmm. We want to give all that we have to see the work of God finish in our generation. If that's you, if that, if that resonates in your heart, I encourage you to think about becoming a member of ASI. And you know what? Whether or not you remember, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, we are all part of the family, and we are all on a mission to take this message to the world in our generation. And so all of you, consider yourselves part of the family, right, Wayne? <laughs> that's right. That's and right. Uh, we encourage you to ch check out <clears throat> ASI uh, membership, and we would encourage you uh, to send us that text message if you can. God bless you, and uh, may the Lord continue to bless us here tonight. Amen. The more and more I've worked with teams, the more I realize that truly together everyone does achieve more. And I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about the question, why, why a team? Why join something bigger than myself? Something that, that I couldn't do on my own. And the more I've thought about it, the more I've realized that as I join things that are bigger than myself, I start realizing that I can't do it myself. And I have to depend on people around me to get larger jobs done, which really ends up feeding the humility in me and killing the selfishness and killing the pride, which is what Jesus' mission is all about, to get rid of me and to, to fill me up with him. So I think it's awesome to work on a team because I truly believe that when we work together, we achieve more and our hearts are made more like Jesus. Good evening. This evening it's my privilege to introduce and also to pay tribute to a very special lady. Some of you may, know, may not know Helen Eager, but Helen was the co-founder of the ministry Asian Aid, and about 47 years ago in Australia, Helen started shipping clothing, clothing to Asia. 
Helen then gave momentum to the growth of an amazing ministry that in that period of time has grown significantly and placing children in need in Adventist schools, giving them an education and introducing them to Jesus. She's a very modest lady, and may I also say a stubborn and humble lady. Right now, there are about 10,000 children in Adventist schools in India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. We also fund four orphanages with the church and a school for the blind and deaf. Today, I did some calculations and it is my estimate that in the 50 years from the momentum that Helen gave, over 50 to 60,000 children have been given an education in Adventist schools, which is a huge figure. And today, if you travel in those divisions, those children are playing key roles in the schools, in the church, and in business. I also estimate that somewhere between 60 and 90 million dollars have been given to church mission schools. Helen also has been very active in Nepal and early in her days she took a, a huge care and concern for the women of Nepal with prolapse operations. And right now we know that over 11,000 women have had a prolapse operation because of the vision and the need that Helen saw. Helen is a special lady. If you've traveled with her, she travels on motor cart, motorcycles, bullet carts, fourth class on the trains in India. And if you travel around Indian schools, it's not how are you, it's where, mom, where is mummy eager. So in the six years that I've been CEO of Asian Aid USA, I have seen it. And so tonight, Helen, on behalf of Asian Aid USA, I just want to pay tribute to the momentum that you gave in being a part of starting this special organization. It's a real privilege for me. It's a real privilege for me to be associated with Asian Aid. As I used to travel Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Every place I'd go is mommy eager, mommy eager. And Helen, it's just a privilege to give you this service recognition award. And you know, in heaven, you're going to have a big reunion with all those children that have now in the kingdom as a result of your ministry. And we thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a privilege to serve. And those of you who have supported Asian Aid in any way, I just want to thank you sincerely. And if you've been sponsoring a child, I just wish that you could see, as I have, the difference it makes in their lives. So God bless you for caring. Thank you. Good evening. Happy week. Or as they used to say at home during, uh, when I was growing up after Vespers, uh, Feliz Semana. All right. I bring you greetings this evening from the President of the Pacific Union, Elder Ricardo Graham. And on behalf of Elder Graham and my fellow officers, we hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed visiting beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. We even had showers of blessings for you this week. I have the privilege tonight of introducing the speaker for the final session of the 2016 ASI International Convention. He is Daniel R. Jackson, the president of the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. Having been elected to that position in Atlanta, Georgia in 2010 during the general conference session and re-elected last year in San Antonio, Texas. Originally from Canada, Elder Jackson has served the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a pastor, educator, author, and administrator. He and his lovely wife Donna have three children and two grandchildren. Now in just a moment, Elder Jackson will tell you that he is a sinner saved by grace. So he has a passion to preach the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior every time he speaks. And he does so with great enthusiasm and conviction. 
You know, as a former youth director and lifetime pathfinder, I learned the lawn pledge a long time ago, and I've repeated it hundreds of times. The final two statements of the pathfinder law say, keep a song in my heart, go on God's errands. If you know anything about Elder Jackson, you know that he always has a song in his heart. In fact, it's not uncommon while he's chairing committees, boards, and meetings for him to start singing a hymn to call us to order. Eventually, we all join him, and the loud chatter becomes a beautiful choir as we get ready for the meeting. And he has made it his mission to go on God's errands as he boldly leads this great North American division in these last days of Earth's history. So please pray that tonight, as Elder Jackson speaks to us, the Lord will empower him in a mighty way as he has done so many times before. Was it something I said? <laughs> Is it not true? With such an army as our youth rightly trained 
and praise God for the young people. I was watching on the monitor and I actually started to laugh. I said, that young lady shouldn't have all that talent. God has given special gifts to our young people and praise God, we must do all that we can to help them dream, to let them dream, and then to empower them, and then get out of the way. I tell people I am never concerned about the church when I am around groups of our dedicated young people. I'm never concerned about the future of the church. Praise God for that. I never start a, a, a message anymore without doing two things, but I'm adding one thing tonight. I always do a confession and then a profession and tonight an affirmation. The confession is simple. My name is Dan Jackson. I am a broken human being. I am not saying this to you to demonstrate any kind of humility. I am telling you what is the truth. I am a broken human being. Without the grace of a gracious God, I would be on a never-ending spiral downward spiritually. But because of His grace, I have hope. But I am a broken human being. And guess what, folks? He's not finished with me yet. And just in case you hadn't noticed, you're just like me. The profession. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there is only one true north, and His name is Jesus. Let Jesus be the center of all that we preach, of all that we teach. If we teach the Sabbath and Jesus is not in the center of the Sabbath, we ought to quit preaching the Sabbath until we can put Jesus in the center. If we are preaching the three angels' messages, we must put Jesus in the center. If we can't see that Jesus, these things I've written to you, he said, it was Jesus, is Jesus, who is the center of the book. If you can't preach the three angels' messages without Jesus being in the center, quit preaching the three angels' messages until Jesus can be put in the center. If you are teaching the health message, then please, you know, He is the water of life. He is the bread of life. He is the center and the substance of our hope. That's the confession. Thirdly, the affirmation. I want to praise God for our lay people. And I thank ASI for what they have done this week. I have great appreciation for Steve Dickman and, of course, for Kyle, who works around our office. And uh, he came to me and said, I hope you don't mind that I called you my boss today. And Elder Bryant was standing with us. He said, what's wrong with that? He is. <laughs> Kyle is an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And uh, praise God that we have young people who can assume responsibility. I want to go back to a sentence that I quoted this afternoon, but that Elder Bradshaw quoted this morning, because I believe for Christians living in the last gasp of time, that it is important that you and I glean a fundamental understanding from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy as to how we ought to be how we ought to witness, how we ought to have every member involved. You see, if every member is involved and we don't have the ingredient that I want to share with you tonight, we could have every member involved for the next 300 years. 
the church is the repository and I'm going to botch this up a little bit. I've got it written down, but I'll just do it. But the church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And through the church will eventually be made manifest even to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The final and the full display of the love of God. I want to tell you, friends, if you want to talk standards, this is the standard. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, in that you have love one for the other. The final and the full display of the love of God. What is the loud cry? It is a demonstration in the, not just in the words, but in the lives. Now, I want to ask you a question. And I want you to respond, for those of you who understand the question. And I want to do this for you just before you fall asleep. Would all the ministers in this room please stand up? All the ministers in this room, please stand up. I didn't say all the pastors. <laughs> you may be seated. And for those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you didn't stand up, you need to go back and read the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, and recognize the reality that the superficial distinction that has been imposed on the Scripture that is identifying clergy and laity does not exist in the Bible. Pastors have a specific role. I'm not demeaning pastors. I was a pastor for 25 years before I apostatized and became an administrator. <laughs> the role of the pastor... Remind me, folks, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the role of the pastor is to train who? The saints for the work of what? Ministry. When you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, you just signed on to be a minister of the Most High God. Paul says, don't you know that you yourselves are living stones being built together into a spiritual house to offer sacrifices acceptable unto God. There is no such thing as a Christian who does not serve. I, uh, I did something unique one time as a pastor. I was having a baptism and I went to my head deacon and he had two beautiful wing chairs in his living room and I said to him hey would you bring your wing chairs to church on Sabbath with you and he looked at me and said why I said because I want to interview the candidates for baptism and I want to sit in one chair and I want them to sit in the other chair and I want to ask them in front of the church why are you going to be baptized today? What made you make a life commitment to the church? I will never forget one young woman. She, uh, I asked her the question, why in the world are you becoming a Seventh-day Adventist? And she told this story. She had some background, but she told this story. She said, at first, I would just bring my children to Sabbath school, then I'd get lost, and then at the end of Sabbath school, I would come and pick them up and take them home. But every single Sabbath, there was a man at the door who greeted me so warmly, who was so kind and gracious to me, 
that I decided to, that I needed what he had. And I joined the church. Now, let me tell you this. This brother never, ever spoke publicly. Didn't give Bible studies. Didn't preach. But he had an attitude of gratitude that just emanated from him. He was the kind of deacon that would clean under the carpet because there must not be dirt in the Lord's house. You see, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. So do you. He's coming. I want to go home. The time has come for us, for you and for me, all Seventh-day Adventists, to intensify our beliefs so that we can serve God and bring glory to Him and to His name in all that we do, whether it is a family relationship, a school matter, a hospital, wherever we are in the workplace, we must consistently be bringing glory to God. That has become your role. I want to look at this with you, and I want to reference a Bible passage tonight. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And you might say, well, this is a rather odd passage, but it reads like this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by your prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What do people see in you and me? as they watch us? That's a telling question, friends. What do they see in us? Is our silent life testimony so powerful and compelling that those watching us would make a lifetime commitment to Jesus because of what they saw? You see, we are preoccupied in the North American division with the dream of reaching every community in this land our homes, our schools, our business places, our churches, everything we have must be dedicated to the furtherance of God's cause on this planet. We have a dream that every single member of the church in North America will read the Scriptures, will be impressed by the Holy Spirit, and will become involved in God's great evangelistic thrust on this earth before Jesus comes. It is a splendid vision. However, let me say that if we do not personally demonstrate our connection with Jesus, then all other systems fail. Allow me to share a very powerful statement with you. As a matter of fact, for those of you who want to engage in soul-winning activities, <laughs> I have a key for you tonight, a very powerful key, and it comes from the book Christ Object Lessons, pages 299 and 300. And this is what it says, we are to show the world and all the heavenly intelligences that we appreciate the wonderful love of God for fallen humanity, and that we are expecting larger and yet larger blessings from His infinite fullness. Then she goes on, far more than we do. We need to speak of the precious chapters of our experiences. These exercises do three things, she says. Number one, drive back the power of Satan. Number two, they expel the spirit of murmuring and complaint, and the tempter loses ground. And number three, they cultivate those attributes of characters of character which will fit the dwellers on earth for the heavenly mansions. Whoa! That's quite a statement. She says that rehearsing in our own mind the goodness and the grace of God as it relates not only to the world but to me. Listen to how she ends the statement. She says, such a testimony will have an influence upon others. No more effective means can be employed for the winning of souls to Christ. No more effective means can be employed 
for winning souls to Christ. So here's the question tonight. How do I become like that? What Paul tells us in his powerful statement in Philippians chapter 4 is that lasting peace and happiness come to those who put their trust and faith in God. That is, they allow their lives to be preoccupied with God. And then things begin to happen. Paul was attempting to tell the Philippians that they needed to be ever concerned with this. But what we're talking about here is successful, transcendent, daily spiritual living. That's where we need to be, friends. The next time I am tempted to be angry, and, you know, I, I, I do have to tell you, I've already told you I was broken, but I do have to tell you I was a sinner. I am a sinner. I said this once at a camp meeting, and a lady came up to me and said, you are a president. You must never tell people that you are a sinner. And I said to her, thank you so much. From now on, I'll just lie. <laughs> the next time we're tempted to be angry, we need to think about the goodness of God. I want to suggest there are three things that can turn us into dynamos for Jesus Christ. Three ideas that emerge out of the Scripture. Number one, the recognition that the love of God desires only good for us. We've got to settle that in our mind. He is not some kind of eternal ogre looking to pounce on us. The love of God desires only good for us. I walked into his office, and if you've heard me tell this story before, I'm telling it again. I walked into his office. This man, the president of the Rwandan Union, he had left his home in the early 90s to go out and do a weekend of preaching. And when he returned home 120 days later, he discovered that his wife, three children, and nine grandchildren had been slaughtered in the genocide. I walked into his office and I said to him, Brother Amon, I know that a person's pain is something very personal to them. And for somebody to come walking into your life and say, tell me about it, is not only, can not only be rude, but it's just inappropriate. I know that is like holy ground, but I want to ask you, how did you survive that? And this was his answer. He said, I want you to know that God has been good to me from the very beginning. He went on to say, I know the people who killed my family. They live not too far from here. I see them from time to time, but I pray for them every day. Let me tell you something, friends. That is not natural. That is supernatural. That is a gift from God through Jesus Christ. His life went on because he knew in his heart that God was good, eternally good, and that the love of God only desires that which is best for us. David wrote it this way. He said, shout to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with joy. Come before him with singing. Know that the Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are the people, the sheep he tends. Come into his city with songs of thanksgiving and into his courtyards with songs of praise. Thank him and praise his name. And why does David say all this? He winds up in verse 5 of Psalm 100 by saying, the Lord is good, his love is forever, and his loyalty goes on and on. I walked into her hospital room. It was a very awkward situation for a man with a woman. 
this dear sister had had radical mastectomy. I do want to say just exactly how much does a man have to say to a woman at that point. If it's your wife, that's one thing. But in any other circumstance, but you know, I had a philosophy as a pastor, and that is, unless there was some very serious problem, when I went into a hospital room and you're sleeping, I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder. And so I did. I gently touched her shoulder with my hand, and this dear sister opened up her eyes and looked into my face, beaming, and said, Pastor, God has been so good to me. <laughs> the next part wasn't quite that, you know, quite that good. She said, do you want to see what they did to me? And she started to pull the sheets down. I was halfway down the hall. <laughs> Christianity is demonstrated in the crucible of life. If I want to be a part of the last day movement, then I must become a part of the final and the full display of the love of God. Need to recognize, need to recognize that God is good and that His will for me is always good. Point number two, the wisdom of God always knows best. Jeremiah wrote, quoting God, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, we so often question God. I remember seeing a church member one time. I was sitting in the dock of the ocean, and he came into the dock with his boat and he was angry at God because he hadn't caught any fish. Sometimes we don't understand how things can happen. But we do know that if we place our hand, or rather our life, in the hand of God, the wisdom of God always knows best, even when things look like they are ridiculous to us. In 1980, I received a phone call late one night. It says I have five minutes and 29 seconds left. <clears throat> Good luck. <laughs> Every technician has said, well, good for you, buddy. We're just turning you off in five minutes and 16 seconds. Go for it. <clears throat> Got a call from the General Conference. They said, we would like you and your family to relocate to Sri Lanka. First question, where in the world is Sri Lanka? When I was a kid, it was Ceylon, the pearl of the Indian Ocean. I didn't know. I said, we'll pray about it. Had to do something. In town, went to town, came back, typed out a letter, you know. Anybody under 45 know what a typewriter is? Anyway, typed out a letter. It said, Dear brethren, thank you so much for considering my name, but I will not be able to go to Sri Lanka. And I began to list a number of reasons. Then I again was interrupted. I had to go. When I came back, my dear wife wrote a letter for me. It read like this. Dear brethren, I'm so sorry I can't go to Sri Lanka because they don't have motels over there or big green glad garbage bags, etc., etc., etc. And I went to her and I said, are you mocking the servant of the Lord? <laughs> I did not want to go. I did not want to go to Sri Lanka. I was happy in Canada, but I made the mistake of praying. It wasn't a mistake. But I began to pray. And the more I prayed, the more God worked in my mind. And he told me two things. You cannot draw a geographical circle around where you will serve God. Secondly, you cannot or ought not to draw a circle of convenience around where you will serve God. 
I wrestled with that for two weeks. And finally, in conclusion, I phoned the brethren. <laughs> now, the voice who had called me initially had been happy and cheery, but when I phoned them this time, I said, Hi, this is uh, Dan Jackson calling. I, my family and I have prayed about this, and we've decided to accept the invitation. And the voice on the other end wasn't nearly so cheery. The voice on the other end said, We're sorry, we've already filled that call. Now, one would think one would be sad, but on my end of the phone, I was doing this, yes, yes, yes. And I went and found my wife. I drove to the school that she was teaching at. I found her, and when I saw her, I said to her these words, it was a test, it was only a test, and we passed the test. <laughs> and then I said these words that were almost fatal words. I said to her, now I can finish the basement. Of course, every pastor, that's the role, right? Finishing basements. We had something to do that. Actually, had a funeral to conduct. Went out, conducted the funeral, came home. We were eating supper. The phone rang. It was that crazy woman from the general conference. And she had her cheery voice on again. She said, are you still willing to go to Sri Lanka? And I said, the conditions that led me to say yes the first time are still there. We will go to Sri Lanka. Let me tell you something, friends. I did not want to go to Sri Lanka. But what I have told people since is that it was not always pleasurable, but it was always beneficial. The wisdom of God knows best. If we put our lives into His hands, He will bring us off more than conquerors. Finally, the third point, and I'm skipping through this as quickly as I can, the third element that can make your witness and mine more effective for Jesus is the power of God the power of God that can bring about our requests. I, um, before I went overseas, I sold, I sold my house. We had just bought a house. And I sold the house. You know, I mean, th th this will sound like a dream, but the house is a brand new home. Bought a, it was about 1,100 square feet. Bought it for $50,000. And 11 months later, I sold it for 80000 we paid our tithe. We did a number of other things. We had $20,000, and I, my wife and I agreed, we'll take that money and we'll put it aside for our children's education. Because, by the way, kids cost a lot of money. <laughs> and we went to Sri Lanka. We invest, I actually bought a five-acre piece of land. We took off, went to Sri Lanka. From there, we went to India. About five years later, you know, we were not exactly the long-term missionaries. We were more like tourists, but had a wonderful time. It was a blessing from God. When we came back, couldn't sell the land. Couldn't sell the land. We prayed about it. We tried to sell it. I put that little investment of 20000 which then was a pretty good chunk. Couldn't sell the land. Not at all. But you know what happened? clock went to zero. But <laughs> what happened was this. After the last one of our children had finished, we got a phone call. Someone wants to buy your land. They've offered $7,000. I said, send the check immediately. <laughs> and we took it and we used it. But you see, all along, God didn't need, need my money. He didn't need my plan. My children were provided for. They got their education because of the power of God. Listen, friends, I'm going to close, but I'm going to close by reading a statement that is a wonderful statement from Desire of Ages, page 331. It reads like this, Those who take Christ at His word and surrender their souls to His keeping, their lives to His ordering, 
we'll find peace and quietude. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. Our lives may seem to be a tangle, but as we commit ourselves to the wise master builder, he will bring out the pattern of life and character that will be to his own glory. The love of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God. Friends, we need to rehearse those moments in time where those elements have been experienced in our lives. And then we'll become master soul winners for Jesus. We are living in the final gasp of earth's history. We are. You know, you used to be able to say, well, yeah, but there's... You can't say that, yeah, well, anymore, can you? The events transpiring in our world are so tragic and so breathtaking that one says, oh, dear Lord, not another one. Not another shooting. Not another terrorist attack. Not another phony baloney politician, whatever. By the way, I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. Amen. amen. That's right. Whoever said amen. I'm a Canadian. I don't vote. <laughs> I, I do want to tell you that Canada, not too long ago, elected a 16-year-old prime minister, but I better not say that. <laughs> For all you Canadians, you can take the word back. Here's how I want to conclude. Many years ago, I built a house actually had an arrangement with the conference as I was transferring from one conference to another was the only way I could get into housing. I built a house. Smartest thing I did was to hire a contractor to put the foundation in under that house. By the time I arrived on the site, it was there, it was good, it looked good. I put up subfloors and all the rest and put up the walls. Sounds really... See, there goes all the credits. I guess they're gone. But they probably heard the story before anyway. But I put up the walls. It wasn't that big a deal. It was a prefab house. The walls were sheeted and the windows were in the walls. But nonetheless, I put it up. And one day...